Our next speaker is from UK, uh, Holly. She's working as a user experience designer. As you probably know, most of the applications today, uh, it, one of the things which is really important for them is to provide a user, good user experience. I know Holly for years, and I know that she's a really good uh, user experience designer. And today, she's going to talk about developers versus designers. Holly. Um, okay, well, hi. So um, I'm going to be talking about the slightly uneasy relationship that sometimes designers and developers have. So, I mean, I don't know why, but it's kind of built up into a thing over the years where you end up sort of on the same team with people, but actually arguing with them a lot of the time and not understanding each other. So I thought I'd talk a bit today about possibly the reasons why that is, the misunderstandings that can happen, and a few different techniques that you can use um, to try and get past those things and actually make the working relationship a lot better. Um, so we'll just skip past this because it's just who I am. So I'm going to be going over um, what designers actually do, so the differences between UX designers, UI designers, um, and service designers. Also, how to work with designers, uh, different types of working, and some tips and tricks. So why would you want to work with designers? We're really fussy. We're really anal about things, and things like this just make me feel insane. Um, we can be quite difficult, but when we work together with people and we do something um, that looks beautiful, it can really help users understand a product. And that's, that's my main um, point when it comes to why bring a designer into a project ever is that actually by doing that, you're going to be more user-focused, and actually they'll, then your product gets out there and people will use it more often. So what do designers actually do? So quite often, the design process will be kind of behind closed doors, and we'll go away and we'll say, oh, you can't see anything for a while. You have to wait until I'm ready to show you. So I thought I'd look at a couple of the things that we do um, day to day to just um, kind of explain. So we'll quite often set up color palettes for things and make sure that tonally it works with what the product's trying to do. Uh, we also do type systems. So these are just super basic components of what we're doing, but it all kind of comes together and forms a brand and gives people an expectation of what the um, digital product is going to do and how they might interact with it. So quite often when we look at things, we can make assumptions about them very quickly. And all of these small things about type and color go towards that. You also have grid systems. There's a lot more to it, but these are just kind of basic components. And just to kind of reinforce this point, I thought I'd show a couple of examples of people who do it really well. So Apple, obviously, are hyper-invested in design. They use it as a unique selling point. And it's actually become something that they're known for. So everyone knows that their products are very easy for anyone to pick up and learn without too much instruction. And that's great, because it gives them um, a difference in market share. And then when we look at things, I've just used an example here, if it animates. But small little animations and interaction design can actually add elements to um, products that make it feel very, very human. And the interface feel like it actually reacts to someone touching it. So rather than being very static, putting these small pieces of movement and animation in can really help get your meaning across. And also a thing that's um, very important in terms of design is actually coherency. So across a family of products, you should always be able to tell that it um, has the same purpose, it's by the same people. And design is a great way to do that. So this is a rebrand that was done for Airbnb. And you can kind of see it goes across the interface design all the way down to the interactions. They actually did a lot of film work to help get across to people what the meaning of Airbnb is. Because although a lot of people are familiar with it, um, large sort of sways of the public aren't. And they need to, it's kind of a weird concept if you've not heard about it before, and they need to be able to communicate this very easily. Um, by doing the rebrand, they kind of um, changed the positioning so it's very, very friendly. And the tagline became belong anywhere. And it kind of explains what they were going for. So everything sort of backs it up from the friendliness of the colors, the chunkiness of the buttons. The interface is very easy for people to use. And it's all coherent across the system. And that also, they did quite a lot in social media as well to help with this campaign. 
So products that people actually love to use, they kind of go outside of just that product and people take them into social, they become advocates. And if you're, do, if you're building products and services that people really enjoy, they will go out and speak to them and you can grow your user base. If you take real care of what you're doing, people will advocate for you. And I think that this is probably the most important point, is that design is human. It's not about is it pretty, um, but about the connection it creates between a product and our lives. So when we're actually thinking about products, or um, whether it's a digital product or a physical product, they perform a purpose. And when that purpose is done well, and done easily, quickly, um, without any interference, people like it, and they come back and use it time and again. If they come to a product and it's difficult to learn, they have to read a set of instructions. They need a certain level of programming knowledge to be able to interact with it. It's very difficult for people to actually get on board and start to use it, and it becomes quite exclusive. So designers solve problems. We just look to slightly different ways to do it. We'll do visual problem solving as well as conceptually, but realistically, everyone's a designer. So when you think about preparing a meal or what clothes you're going to wear for that day, you've actually made a design decision and you've put something together for yourself. Um, and you might be sharing it with other people. So if you plan a dinner party, that's a type of design. You might be planning where people are sitting. You might be planning the music that you're going to do. You're going to be planning what you're going to cook. All of these are small elements and they make up an experience design. And looking at with, without any of those elements, it would be a very different experience at that dinner party. So you need to have all of them kind of working in coherence to build the atmosphere and the experience that you want. And with designers, digital is kind of new for us. It's not something that we necessarily have always been involved in. Um, designers who come from a traditional art school background, what we get taught is normally printmaking and bookbinding and typography skills. These are really important and they are transferable to digital. But I think it's really, it's kind of important for us to learn alongside people and with people and not feel like the sort of um, barrier to entry is too high, that we have to know about enough development so we could be involved in a project. Because um, that can be quite off-putting. So I think it's really important to kind of think, how can we welcome people in and talk about it in a way that's going to make them feel included? I'm going to skip through some of these. But basically, with um, digital, it's constantly changing. Um, we've now got the internet of things, God knows what's next, something else is coming. And all of the time, we need to constantly learn together. And if you come at it from a design perspective or from a development perspective, we kind of need each other to actually build these products and services. So we need to be looking at ways we can learn with each other rather than fight against each other. So there are kind of different types of designer. I'm just giving you a brief, well, brief, um, kind of big overview of design so that when I kind of talk about why there are problems, everyone's sort of on the same page because I feel like sometimes that's part of the issue that we don't know. We don't learn enough about the people that we work with. and We end up just viewing them as colleagues and not necessarily as friends. And if someone's a colleague, you don't make the time to bond with them and find out sort of what perspectives that they come from. And if you do, it's much better. Um, so we have user experience designers, which is what I do. Um, we tend to be focused on things like user personas, so coming up with ideal sort of straw men and women um, that represent the people who are actually going to be using your product. And these can be really useful when you're trying to make product decisions because it helps you not focus on yourself and it means you focus externally as well. Um, then you might have people who are UI designers. <coughs> so this is an example from the Airbnb rebrand. But they're going to be more focused on the interface and not necessarily so much on the customer journeys that take people through the product. So they'll be... Um, sometimes there's an illustration that gets shown around quite a lot. It's like a big iceberg, and the thing that you see above the water is the UI design, and the stuff that's below the water is the UX design and the development, and it's actually um, the systems that are in place, the way that people move through different flows, how they achieve what they need to with the product. That's the um, experience design, and then the UI is kind of what's put on top of it. Um, to make it beautiful and feel a certain way and so people understand when they come to it how they could interact with it. And this is something that 
I kind of wrestle with myself because at one point I could code and now I can't anymore. So it's a skill set that I lost through lack of practice. Um, I used to do action script for Flash years and years ago. I was pretty shoddy, but it was enough to get what I could do done. Um, and it meant that I was fairly self-sufficient. I didn't need to necessarily be part of a team. I could do it by myself. Whereas now, I've realized there are people who are way better at it than me. So probably working with them is a good idea rather than working alone. Um, I think it's really important for both sides to understand the medium that we're working in. So as much as I think um, it's important for designers to understand a little bit about um, the development ecosystem or how code's set up, it's actually just as important the other way around for developers to understand a design system and how we put all those building blocks together so that we can actually kind of um, move together rather as two separate pieces. And then there are the magical people, the unicorns who can do both. And I would love it if I could be one of these people. It would be amazing. But I'm not. So um, if you are, that's awesome. And I just am so jealous, basically. Um, and when we're looking at design, something that I think is really important is that it's as little as possible. It's not something that is layer upon layer upon layer of meanings. When you're using visuals or image-based things, as, when you start to layer them and put more on top of each other, you're just um, increasing the levels of meaning that people have to sort through to find the interface that's underneath or actually the purpose of the product. So you need to kind of strip it all the way back so it's just enough that people understand how to use it there are affordances in there, like if something's a button or a link, people can tell, so they can click it. Because uh, if they can't, they can't really use it so well. So this is the bit where I'm kind of here to talk about, really, is when we all start fighting. Um, and the reason that I kind of thought up this talk was I was on a project maybe six months or so ago, and it was going really badly. And we had these like fantastic ideas, we wanted to do everything. Um, and our timelines were too short. We weren't moving fast enough to get it done. So we started cutting features, and we cut, and we cut, and we cut. And that's the, if anyone's ever been on a project where you cut a feature set back like that, that's upsetting in itself. So the morale of the team was at this point, it was just rock bottom. And so we turned on each other. And rather than actually moving together and solving it as one unit, we, we kind of split up into our disciplines. And so the UX designers were over here being like, I've got my user research, and it says this thing. And then the UI designers were like, but that doesn't look beautiful. Why would I want to be doing that? And then the developers were just kind of going, oh, we don't have any time left. We're supposed to have cut that feature. I don't know why we're arguing about it anymore. And it just meant that we were all pointing fingers at each other and trying to find people to blame. And I think it was, yeah, it was deeply upsetting. And the only way we got through it was we kind of tried to strip out the layer of management above us. So <laughs> yeah. it basically meant that there was, so I was the design manager, so I kind of went, OK, right, everyone you need to be together now. And then the, the development manager, and we kind of had to take a step back and say, OK, the designers and the developers need to sit next to each other, for God's sake. We're on different floors. We're in a huge building. Um, we're not sitting next to each other because there's desk problems. And it's just ridiculous. We were using these small excuses to stay hemmed up in our own disciplines rather than actually working as one team. And it meant that the thing we were building suffered a lot. And it was really difficult to get the morale back on that project and make people feel as one. So I think it's really, um, it's a good thing to actually talk about it. Because when things start to go wrong like that, the only thing you can really do is be brutally honest. Because otherwise, there are these tensions that are underlying and people kind of play on their prejudices and fall back into their sort of your team rather than the whole team. And there are some pretty uncomfortable truths, but if you actually air them, it's going to be better for the project. But 
That was the little depressing bit aside, because it kind of went OK in the end. Um, but here are some ideas of different things to do. So I've kind of just ranted over all of these slides. So I can just get through them. So why are the misunderstandings? Um, so a lot of the projects that I've worked on, we've run them like a relay race. So the designers have gone first, or possibly even the strategists, and then they hand off to the designers, and then the designers hand off to the developers. And it's basically like you'll pass the responsibility down the road. And rather than keeping an eye on it the whole time, you're like, well, this is my bit done, and I did my bit great. So it's your go now. And it's actually really detrimental, because it means that people don't feel ownership of what they're doing. And one of the most important things to make sure that a team or a product is delivered and people are actually happy and enjoy doing it is that you have a common goal and a common purpose. And running it like this so you just hand it off and go, someone else's problem, is just it's not the best way to do that. And then I've got a lovely picture of a waterfall. And that's known as waterfall, which is obviously a delightful um, project management term. It's, in some ways, Waterfall works a lot better for designers, if I'm honest, because we get a bit of time where we can go, OK, how do I want this to be? What do I want it to look like? And then we reveal it, rather than sort of having to be showing our work in progress, which no one really likes to do. Um, but you do have to do it. So I would recommend that if you have a chance, if you are doing a Waterfall project and you have no other choice but to do it like that, to get involved in the scoping process at the beginning. So at least when something does get handed off to you, at whatever stage you're in in that process, you were there when the strategy was decided, so you know what the goal is, rather than just sort of receiving a set of templates or frames or modules that you suddenly have to decide how to build, which is not easy or comfortable for anyone. And then I found this... Um, kind of comic strip thing that summed up some of the arguments that I've sat in. Um, but it's basically about people coming at things from um, a belief system and thinking that they are 100% right. I'll skip to the next slide in a second so you can see how the end is. Um, but you end up describing things in a way that make it sound like if the other people on the team don't agree with you, they don't necessarily know what they're doing, or it's like... Um, I can't remember which side it's on, but on one of them, someone's like, I've got a trump card. I can say no, and then use sort of technical jargon to hide behind it. You can do that from a design perspective as well. Anyone can do that, and you suddenly go, oh, no, it's my specialism, and I've got a great reason why we can't do it this way, because I don't want to. Not because it's not possible, because um, obviously anything's possible if you've got infinite time and infinite budget, which we don't often have, but actually it's more important to explain it in those terms of saying, well, we've only got a month, so I'd love to. It is possible, but we can do this within a month's time period, rather than just, no. And obviously, this one, they kind of palm it off to um, user testing in the end. And when we get into those sort of debates and when the team's not pulling together, we make stuff that's really user-unfriendly. And when something isn't easy for people to use, or they don't understand it, or it makes them feel excluded. They just don't come back, and they won't reuse it. And people have, you know, they, they've got a fairly high tolerance for things not working great if it achieves the goal they need to. But the more often that they're, you make them feel like they've made a mistake, or they get error messaging and no guiding and where to go next, it just it makes people very uncomfortable. And as soon as there's that uncomfortable awkwardness, they just don't come back. Um, so this is something that really annoys me, is when people use exclusive language. So I've probably used loads of it, actually, in this talk. So I'm going to put my hands up and say that, you know, I do tend to speak as a UX, and we'll just use terms without actually thinking them through as to that maybe not everyone understands them. But when we get into these debates, it's really important that actually we explain in you know, plain English, for want of a better phrase, actually what we mean and why we mean it, rather than just um, hiding behind these sort of industry-exclusive words, actually imagine 
that you're explaining it to someone who, it's like an elevator pitch, and you need to be explaining it to someone who hasn't been through everything that you have. And you need to be able to make them to understand why the problem's there. And that could maybe seem like dumbing down, but I think it's actually really important that we recognize the fact that everyone does this, and it's very um, exclusionary, and it doesn't make things um, come together as a whole. So, the more, the more fun bit was how to set yourself up for success. So, basically, the projects that I've worked on that have been the most successful, I've paired up with a developer, and we'll work together as a team. So, constantly, I'll be sketching, they'll be sketching. Um, sketching and a lot of the user experience design activities actually are super easy to learn. You don't need to have um, loads of experience in it. And you can actually, like, everyone's input is valid. And when you're running a project like this, so you do a lot of... Um, stakeholder interviews or user research, actually all of those techniques that get used by UX designers can be used within the team. And you can interview your team about what do they expect from this project, what are they looking for, and you can be brainstorming together. And it just means that everyone has this joint vision of where you're going, rather than like, oh, I only know about the design bit, or I only know about the development bit. It's, it's always as one. And if you don't have, I think, if you don't have a, um, a developer to pair up with, even just designers pairing up together is helpful. I think it happens quite often um, in the development community, although, well, I think it does, I'm not super sure, but pair programming is something that I've heard about, <laughs> and I believe that it happens a lot. <laughs> um, I could be totally wrong. But it doesn't happen in the design community that often. We're fairly hierarchical and you kind of have to do what the creative director or the art director says in the end. But actually, if we were a bit better at pairing up with people, whether it's members of the same discipline or members of other disciplines, it would be really helpful. And I think there's a lot we could learn from that kind of ethos of actually two people working on something at exactly the same time to move it forward faster. And I feel bad that my presentation is littered with the word user now after <laughs> this talk this morning, but it kind of is. It's in my job title as well, so that makes me feel even more uncomfortable. <laughs> but anyway, um, so user-centered design. This is something that I think, as I said, um, that everyone can get involved in. And it's a great way of making the team feel like they own a project together. So, and the number one rule is, I am not my user. So those kind of like arguments that you have where you go, I'm sure about this thing, or you kind of just feel it in your gut, actually, you just, you don't know. And the people who are actually going to be using the things, they may not agree. And this is probably the best illustration of that. Um, so I don't know if anyone recognizes this or knows who it is. Yeah? Uh, it's probably, probably. Um, I've kind of just found it off the internet, but it's Narcissus. So anyone who doesn't know uh, the story of Narcissus, I'm going to tell it really badly, and I can't say the word properly either. So um, he obviously was walking through the woods. There was um, a nymph called Echo. She fell in love with him, and he basically burned her and was like, uh, uh no. This is not happening. And then he saw his reflection, and he thought, oh, God, that guy, that's the guy. And then um, he became so obsessed with looking inwardly, he actually um, killed himself and drowned, because that love could never be reciprocated. I think it's kind of a good, a good way to think about, actually, you need to step outside yourself, because otherwise, if you look inwardly too far, you're at risk of drowning or, like, scuppering the project, because you're only designing for just you and... This guy's a pretty good illustration of that. Um, so the kind of things that you need to ask yourself are who are you actually making it for? I would love if all of the projects that I worked on were for everyone, um, were, super, um, were super inclusive, and I thought that everyone in the world was going to use them. They're not. It's going to be some people, um, a few people, who probably have a specific task to undertake or maybe have an interest in a particular sector. A lot of my work tends to be um, around cultural sector and events. So most of the people who want to go are of slightly specific demographics. 
and they tend to, you know, either have young children or an interest in the arts. So a lot of the people that we end up designing for, we know quite a lot about them and we make sure that we're focusing on them and that it's easier for them because, you know, I don't have young kids, so I, I'm not... If I was just thinking about me, I wouldn't be able to design an interface that went, okay, I've got two kids, I've just got to do something with them now. I need to find food in this area that's suitable for kids, which, you know, is one of our imaginary scenarios that we came up with. But you have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and say, okay, well, you know, that's not important for me, but for them, that's a key element to this interaction. Um, when they're going to use it, so quite often now we've obviously got loads of products in our pockets, we'll carry them around with us, we've got tablets, so when someone's using um, a product or service becomes incredibly important and that might actually fluctuate during the day, so you might end up having a different type of content in the morning to what you'd have in the evening because people's browsing habits change. And then we have where they're using it, so one of the things that I've been working on recently has video in it and it's an app. So if you also play um, video with sound and you don't have headphones in, you kind of annoy everyone around you. Everyone's been on a bus or on public transport where someone's got kind of music blaring out of their mobile or they click on something and a film starts playing. It's kind of weird and everyone looks around at them and you don't want to be responsible for having designed an interface that does that to people. So you need to be thinking about you know, where they might be when they're using it as well. Um, and what devices, because devices will change how people interact with things. So it might be that the sort of um, features that you put on a mobile are not the same as on a desktop. And why? Why would they want to use your service? I think this is probably the most important one to have straight in everyone's minds. What is it about the thing that you are making that is special, that means that people want to use it? And then once you've got that point in your mind, you kind of going back through the, okay, well, when and where and what are they using it on? But the why question is super important. And then something which has helped in a lot of the projects we've done is actually being located in the same place. When you're dispersed across multiple time zones, multiple um, cities, even in the same time zone, Communication can be really difficult. I know it's not ideal, not everyone can be co-located together. But even if it's just for a week, every now and again, the results that you'll get out of that week are so important because that's the point where you actually bond and you move through the just seeing someone as a face on a screen halfway around the world that you, you, know, you don't know anything about them to like knowing what they like to eat for lunch and for dinner and caring about them as people. And I think when we're working, actually caring about the people that we're working with and the products that we're, and the people who are going to be using our products, it's just, it's respectful to both of them. And that's one of the things about working together properly as a team is most of it comes down to respect. And if you lose respect for people or you behave in a way where people lose respect for you, the team dynamic goes and you just, you can't do it. So I think, you know, it's a lot of this stuff is super simple. It's just treat people how you would want to be treated and try and give people a bit of understanding when they're having a shitty day, because everyone has a shitty day. But, you know, it's, it does affect what you're actually building. Um, so I kind of already told you this story about lo being located on different floors, but the difference that that made was phenomenal. It meant that we just... We started to get on, and I actually knew something about them rather than just being like, oh, it's the development team. They're doing this thing downstairs. And I was like, oh, they haven't delivered. Great. To being like, oh, okay, I feel invested. Like, you know, at that point, I started to be invested in them. And I was like, oh, they haven't delivered, but actually they needed this thing from me that I didn't do. And you start to kind of see how your actions impact other people's actions. And so the main thing is obviously talking. So when you are located in different spaces, having calls every single day as often as possible and it not being like it's official meeting time. It should just be like, I've got a question and you should feel comfortable enough to be able to call people up. And even if you think it's kind of a stupid question, to not be embarrassed about it and just do it. Um, so the meetings face-to-face -face and making the connections, it's kind of something I've banged on about a lot so far, is actually how important 
interpersonal relationships are in work. But if you don't do it at the beginning of a project, try and do it some point during it before the end, because otherwise when you get to the end, you won't have learned anything about the people you are with. And something that I think can work well for that is, I've noticed the spelling error because I only made this slide earlier. Um, anyway, <laughs> is actually designing and developing in the open. So as I said, designers tend to kind of lock themselves in a cupboard and uh, present these beautifully fleshed out designs that are absolutely complete and you can't touch them because I've worked for weeks on them and they're perfect, uh, which is obviously not true. Um, so when you have this kind of team ethos and you're pulling together, or maybe if you've paired up, someone's going to know what's coming. It's not going to be like the big reveal surprise. I think as teams, we should be um, working together so that we're presenting to the clients or to the public. We shouldn't be presenting internally to each other. We should already know what everyone is working on and how far they are with a particular feature, whether it's um, a development feature so that I know what like, you know, what's tricky in that interface, and someone knows that I'm really struggling over here with this user journey and I just can't do it. And we should feel kind of able to jump in and help in each other's disciplines. Even if I might not have the programming skills, maybe we even just talking it through with me or with someone else might just give you a bit of space and your brain a bit of time to think it through in a slightly different way. And that can just be invaluable. This is a project where we had to do it. And the, unfortunately, it's over now, which is kind of sad. But um, I spoke about this project a little bit last year. So it was a full open design project. So everything that we did, we blogged about. Um, we went and talked about it. We had um, a festival at the South Bank Centre called The Web We Want, which was part of the um, sort of Web We Want movement. And so we were trying to design a new website for them. And we, we just got things up there. And they're half finished. They're not brilliant. Um, they could have been better, but we constantly were putting stuff up and publishing. And even if you don't necessarily do that to the public, doing it within your team is really important. Just having that communication regularly. Um, so if you are in different places, just having an email go around sort of once a week to remind people of what everyone has achieved during that week, whether it's that someone does a screen recording and is like, oh, look, this feature works now, and does a demo of it. Um, so that you can see what it is and explains it to people, or whether I just put some JPEGs of a mood board that I've done in. It's, again, this constant communication to make sure that people understand what each other are doing. Uh, this project went as far as to have us work in a glass box so the public could see what we were doing as well, which is pretty cool, and it means that you just kind of have to let go totally and go, okay, someone can see me looking at Facebook when I was supposed to be working. Um, but, you know, that happens. And it's... I think it helped me let go and stop be so precious about design because you just can't be precious when everyone can see what you're doing. And that's brilliant. And it means that what you achieve by doing that is so much better because there's no big surprises for anyone, no big reveals. And I just think it's better all round. Um, so discovery phase is something that we tend to do quite a lot. I'm just going to show you some kind of outputs of it, but I would say that anyone on a team, whatever discipline, should always be involved in discovery phase. So we kind of have workshops. They might be with stakeholders. So a lot of the time, you'll see someone armed with a pen and a set of post-it notes. Um, they're just great for capturing stuff very quickly, and it means that people aren't precious, and it can also be moved around and reordered. So this is something that's really important when you're kind of at the beginning of a project is not setting anything in stone and going all out and saying, okay, what do we want the vision of this whole thing to be? And we'll scale it back afterwards and going for a big piece rather than small. Mood boards are um, really good. So obviously this tends to be an activity that maybe um, designers or user experience people do more often. But actually there's no reason why you can't, why everyone can't be involved in it and say, well, these are the sort of products that we want to be looking at. This is the kind of feel that we want to be going for. Or these, these are the interaction patterns that I find really interesting and would like to investigate more. And again, design sprints. So sometimes people do these in Agile, sometimes not. But they tend to be kind of lo-fi wireframing and possibly building prototypes. And it means that everyone on the team, you, you know, you're not going to do any production-ready code, those, that sprint. 
but you have moved much further towards your goal and it means that everyone's kind of aligned together. So rather than waiting for each other and being in this waterfall method where we're like, okay, I've done my bit and I've passed it on, you're doing it together. So it's just, it's a lot easier. And here are some other examples from discovery phases. So you might have app maps. So until you can actually build it, you kind of make these maps and diagrams of where it's going and where it's going to be. And this also helps people kind of tick it off in their minds as to how far along the journey you are. And then prototypes, which is my favorite bit of doing things. So actually, if, you, um, if you're working together as a pair, you can build prototyping code, which is always better than the prototypes you can build in prototyping tools, which are kind of clunky and they don't work brilliant. They're good enough and you can test with them, but they're nowhere near as good as you could have done as a pair. And I think that's the most important thing, because you can put these interactions in front of people and see if they actually work. And at that point, you can start to take risks with the interface and say, well, you know, maybe this interaction is going to work a lot better than a traditional one. And you can kind of start putting it out there and testing it against each other, because you'll, you, know, you produce more as a team. And style guides are super important. They just mean that, um, say, for example, the design is away and you're not sure what to do, you can carry on working. So you know um, the design language of the product. So you don't know what every screen looks like, but instead you know what the component pieces look like. So you know if you're going to put a form together, you use this bit, that bit, the other bit. Um, you know your color palette. And you can build a lot of things, actually, um, you know, very, very easily and quickly. It also helps extend the life of projects. So if you want help from outside and you need other people to contribute, but you don't want their bit or their feature that they're working on to look totally different and it be like um, a patchwork quilt, which is not great when it comes to user experience, because if things don't feel part of one family, it's really obvious and it start, it's really jarring and you get into this sort of very uncomfortable situation with the interface. Um, and Mozilla's got one. That's just an example of that. And then the, this is something that I saw recently. Um, the Eames are very famous product designers from the 60s, but it's about thinking about the details. And this screen kind of sums it up for me the most. So this is the Ryanair mobile site, and I was trying to book a flight, I think, two days ago. Anyway, I got all excited because there was a sale. So, you know, their marketing had worked and I'd gone to the site and I'm about to um, sort of enter my email address and basically sign up and pay at this point. So you don't, you don't want to lose me or annoy me at this point, so I'm about to give you money. Um, but instead of making it easy, so the email address field, they've not disabled the caps lock. So I start typing my email address, and it starts with a capital letter. And I'm like, hang on a minute, is that going to work? Is that my email address, if it's got a capital letter to start it off with? And you end up with these tiny, tiny pieces of interaction design where someone's just been a little bit lazy, and they haven't thought about it. And if you think about your products and services down to this level of detail, then you can truly compete, and it's really, um, it just makes it a better. So I, you know, in the time it took me to sit there and think, hang on a minute, I've got a change from caps lock to actually, do I want to enter my email address? Like, do I even want this flight? Is this something that I want to be doing? Like that little bit of uncertainty and that pause that I had of thinking, oh, am I being stupid? Does do email addresses work with capital letters? Like, as soon as you've got someone thinking stuff like that, you've lost. They're not going to carry on going through with it. You're either going to unsettle them, they're not going to have confidence, or they might just leave whatever process it is at that point. So this is something that we end up trying to work to. Um, minimal lovable products, not minimal viable products. So a minimal viable product is obviously functional. It works. But people aren't going to love it. There's nothing in there that's actually those tiny pieces of detail that make people want to use it, love using it. It become a habit and then you know, advocate for it. But lovable products, they do. So you have to kind of look at your, whatever you're building and think, what are the moments of delight and joy that I can bring to someone using this? And how does, my, how does this interaction or this type of experience actually benefit their lives? And it really is, it's just kind of respectful and everyone will enjoy the product more. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of it. And it will make, basically the point is that we should respect each other and respect people using your products 
and design experiences that they can use and will love. And this is probably the slide that sums it up best for me. I don't know if you guys know what this cartoon is. Yeah? Does everyone recognize it? So, yeah, basically, Captain Planet, when we come together, we make Captain Planet, and it's awesome. So, work together better. That's kind of it. So, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to go back to this guy, because I like him. <laughs> So I don't know how I'm doing time-wise, if there are questions. Hello. Hey. Um, I want to ask you what is the most um, difficult questions you had with developers and how do you solve them? I think um, probably one that comes up time and again is why we, uh, the, it kind of goes both ways in that there'll be a part of the interface that I maybe have said is not looking correct and is not exactly as I have spec'd it and therefore I am annoyed, um, which is not a good start in the first place. Um, and I think the most difficult question is why. Why is that so important that this thing 100% lines up or is 100% accurate? And it comes back to the system and actually making sure that the system's cohesive. And I kind of try and solve it by going over those things and explaining why that affects the user experience and take it back to that level rather than say, it's just me being anal and I want that moved. So, yeah. Cool. Let's thank again to go.